Good afternoon, Power Hour family. It is Tuesday, the 11th of August. It is episode 70. Don't you just love a good seven number profits? How many <laughs> prophetic words could we get out of that? It is episode 70, and we are so excited to be with you for another week of Power for an Hour, Power Hour, um, where we're going to be talking this week, particularly starting today, about defeating witchcraft. Please do comment, let us know where you are joining from. And if it's your first time with us uh, and you're new to the Power Hour family, extra special welcome to you. And please make sure you comment and let us know that it's your first time. So guys, how are you doing? I think, Emma, you've had a bit of a tragedy today. <laughs> uh, if, if that's right, we have been discussing uh, the the... The, the gruesome events of your morning, haven't we, before we came live? It, it's, it's, it's pathetic, to be yeah. honest. I was very absent-mindedly cutting my toenails. I hope this is not too much information. You see, this is what happens when you go on social media. You know, you feel more at liberty to be, to be you know, authentic about things that you'd never normally say with a microphone in your hand. But I'm cutting my toenails and slipped in some way. And I, I mean, I don't know what, I, I feel like I've lost masses of skin off my big toe. I can hardly stand without pain. I can't get it to stop bleeding. And my nail bed is full of blood. It's like, for goodness, for goodness sake, how pathetic can you be about cutting one toenail on my big toe? Anyway, that's the drama of my I evening and morning. <laughs> that is the most profit way ever to describe cutting your toenail. I've lost masses of skin. There's so much blood I can't control it. And I'm finding it horrifically difficult to even stand. If you ask a prophet about an injury, I mean, that is how we would describe it because we just love, we love the drama of it, don't Prophets, we? we do love a little bit of drama. Oh, Actually, dear. David had to run and go and get the plasters, uh, uh, you know, uh, last night and apply it. And he's like, what were you doing? I don't know. There must be an art. There's an art to cutting your big toenail. There must be. Oh. I don't think, it's not the first time I've done this. No. Anyway. No. <laughs> this is a problem with all the beauticians being closed and we've all taken to doing pedicures ourselves. <laughs> oh. Back to the beauticians. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know it's bad. My 12-year-old, he goes back to school tomorrow. So uh, he's away off with his friends out to McDonald's, which is not a food group. Can I just be clear on that? I'm like, who wants to eat a McDonald's? It's not a food group. So it, he's away off with his friends because it's back to school tomorrow. And we were in the supermarket and he came to me with this cream that he'd find in, in the supermarket. He says, mommy, it's for dry skin on feet. I think you need it. I'm like, what? <laughs> Uh, it's, anyway. Wow. Right. So today you've learned about Emma's feet. Who knew that that would be your lesson within the first five minutes of episode 70 of Power Hour? Sarah Jane, how are your hands? No. How was your, <laughs> how was your hands? Actually, actually, oh. I have great hands at the moment. Joe Malone's hand cream, vitamin E hand cream, is my favorite hand cream. It is wonderful. Somebody bought it for my birthday and it's it's wonderful. I do have dry hands normally. Everyone buys me hand cream because they see how dry my hands are, but this is like the best. Um, I have had what I can say as a fairly uh, adventurous few days since we last met, haven't I, uh, Thursday? So we got home from Tyree, uh, our uh, Hebridean um, uh, holiday place, and we arrived back uh, what day was it? Friday. But in between times, my daughter Sophie took on well and was dramatically airlifted off to the hospital on the mainland. She's fine now. Um, but she did say to me the other day, she was sharing the story with some friends who'd come over to deliver some flowers, which is very sweet of them. Thank you, guys. Um, she did say, I did worry that mum might not believe me because I'm very dramatic and she might not believe how much in pain I was and she might not, you know. So obviously phoned the doctor and he he whisked her off to, to hospital. And so we did have a dramatic ending to our holiday, but I'm glad to be home. And we're home only for a few days, actually, about, I don't know, two weeks. And we have millions of boxes in the corridors all around the house because we are getting ready to move house. So prayers for us as we begin to pack a house up that has had 19 years nearly of living in it. And you can imagine the amount of stuff 
So, yes, we have a bit of a marathon to go. That's well, I mean, I think, I think, I think you're Sophie uh, scared us all. You, you probably chief amongst them with the right. Sophie, the text messages that Sophie's being airlifted, you know, mm. off the island to Glasgow Hospital, and I'm marching around my room, you know, oh. in warfare mode. Key, I'm on a shield. You may not yes. touch Sophie, you know. Absolutely. She exercised all our prayer lives. But, she um, did. She did, and sleep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Walking. But thank yes. God. Thank God she's good. And thank God for praying uh, friends and prophets. Um, so, yes, yeah, she's she's good now and recovered. Yes. Totally. yes. So, um, while, while Sarah Jane had proper drama of a child being airlifted to hospital, I had minor drama of cutting my toenails <laughs> badly. You just spent the whole weekend in a hot tub. Yeah, I had no drama. I had a drama-free weekend. It was glorious. So, well, slight drama on uh, on on Friday, setting the hot tub up. Uh, I got stuck inside it because I flipped it round and was putting uh, I was putting the lights in it, and then I couldn't get because I was like crouching down, and then I couldn't get it off me. So I was for about five minutes stuck underneath an upside down hot tub, but I got it off me. So the drama was short lived, unlike uh, both of your your weekends. So yes. Uh, we had uh, a wonderful, uh, I had a wonderful weekend in the hot tub, slept like a baby after it, feel very relaxed, very chilled out, and it was a great time. We're kind of fighting uh, one another about who's going to get in the hot tub and when. Um, I want to be in it most of the time, but Jenna, my little sister, is fighting for it more. I know we've had these conversations, but sitting in somebody else's dirty skin does not appeal to me. I have very clean skin, to be fair. I'm a very clean, clean, clean person, and my skin is gloriously clean. No, so. no, I mean, it doesn't matter how clean you are. You still shed skin the whole time. So, yes. But it, anyway. filters it. it filters it out. It filters it out. Anyway, yeah. anyway, screw yeah. your talk. Yes, I think we I think we I think we should be spiritual while we talk about defeating witchcraft. And someone was saying, What is on my chin? And I don't know whether to be offended or not. It is a beard. This is a great, <laughs> great beard with manly growth right now. I know you'll be astounded by it. It is it's a sign and a wonder. I know, I know. So uh, we'll just uh, I, I could zoom in, but you might see my ginger hairs that I've found. Uh, that, that I just think somebody needs to lay hands on it and pray for it. <clears throat> anyway, should we move on? Yes, we will. I just saw that comment and it caught me off guard. I thought I had to <laughs> make it right. So obviously today we're talking about defeating witchcraft. We love a good title and we love even more when our title means that we can be in warfare profit mode. Uh, and so the three of us really are going to talk for the next uh, hour of power, the next... Uh, 50 minutes about witchcraft, how we overcome it, how we defeat it, and how to uh, really, we want to expose its work, because we know that anything that's brought into the light has no power. We know that when we bring things into the light, when we bring, say, witchcraft into the light, we disempower it. So uh, we want to do that for the next 50 minutes. Emma, you've really got some uh, kind of words on this about why witchcraft, why now? So do you want to kick us off um, around defeating witchcraft? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Do you know what? I mean, I, I see an, an awful lot of posts on Facebook, actually some from leaders too, about ooh, do, 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 witchcraft. And I think it seems to gender so much fear. And I just got a little bit irritated because actually we should see witchcraft punch the air and go, yes, we know about that and we know how to win. We shouldn't be looking at or thinking about witchcraft and doing this retreat back in this, oh no, I'm out of my depths. This should be something that we are gloriously comfortable and happily victorious in dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I kind of feel like today must be the day of authentic truth-telling that there is witchcraft, that it's real, that it's potent on occasions, that it does come like a little fox on, uh, uh, often, that we are dealing with it, that some of you have been attacked and slimed by it in some actually quite serious ways. 
oh, my husband's coming in with a blaze of glory. And, uh, and that actually we want to be honest about how we deal with that and to give you top tips so that you are not one who goes, I have no idea what to do here, okay? And we have dealt with it in terms of our own criteria. We have dealt with it as, as a company of prophets, the three of us and, and our family here in, our spiritual family here in Scotland at very, very senior levels. This is not something that we are unused to. This is not something we don't have experience with at the most senior level of, of, of covens. Um, and so uh, we're going to uh, uh, just go through, it may take us two or three days because there are three different types of witchcraft. Uh, and of course, witchcraft from you're going to learn as you go and type your, your questions in the comments as well. And we'll see where we can get to. But three different types of witchcraft. Um, and the first one is actual witches, actual witches, warlock, warlocks, voodoo practitioners, witch doctors, who we would call coven live. And just as the church is the meeting place for Christians, so the coven is the meeting place for the witchcraft community. And so just as we go to church, so they go to covens. And so you have that coven level, that's level one. Then the next area of witchcraft is Christian witchcraft. That is from church members. That is cursing words that come within the body of Christ against their own tribe, okay? That is the second type in the house, Christian witchcraft that we do unfortunately to each other. We're gonna cover that. And the third one is self rich witchcraft by your own sin. Uh, or as first Samuel 15 says, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So when you are in rebellion, you are in witchcraft. Okay, so those are the three levels, coven witchcraft, church Christian witchcraft and self witchcraft. Those are the three categories that we need to be mindful of. And um, Sarah Jane, you had a good definition, the definition of coven. Do you want to do that before I make this biblically normal? Sure, yeah. So the coven, which is the, the name given to a group of witches who meet, whether it's white witchcraft, something like Wicca, W-I-C-C-A, or something black witchcraft, which would be more deeply satanic, uh, they call themselves a coven, C-O-V-E-N. And the root of that word is medieval. And it was first used in 1520 um, in, in some history books. But it actually means agreement. It actually means agreement. And, and the important thing that we would note from that is a word covenant, an agreement and a covenant. So it's the beginning of covenant. So if you think coven, covenant, agreement, covenant is really key to that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And actually, just a little bit of, um, of digging around tells us that generally the witchcraft community like to have no more than 13 in their coven because anything more than that proves difficult to manage. So I just found that really interesting as, a, as, a, as an aside, Emma. But the, uh, the community of witchcraft coven means agreement or covenant together. Oh, you're on mute, oh, you're I think. Muted. Okay, yes, the start point for what I would want to say around was with this coven live, coven active, white witchcraft, black witchcraft under the, uh, the uh, you know, the working of dark arts is how limited it is in its power. We must get this before we go a step further. Uh, so, in the kingdom of God, you watching and I have limitless power. God is an unlimited, uncontained God. You are part of a limitless kingdom. This must wash your thinking. I am part of a limitless kingdom of God. So you never wake up in the morning and go, oh dear me, I've only got like three prayers I can pray today, you know, uh, and after I prayed my three prayers, what am I going to do? You know, you never think that. You that never 
enters your head. Why? Because you understand that there is a limitless nature to your connection with God. So you pray continually. You pray without even thinking about it sometimes that your prayers will be accessed and you can tap in to the source of all power in a relentless way without the need to kind of think, oh, oh, is this one allowed? Can I, can I pray this one? Witchcraft communities work totally opposite. They are part of a limited kingdom. And we just have got to punch the air and cheer right now. The kingdom of darkness is limited, limited. It has a cap on it. And so those small coven groups have got to decide how to use their limited small number of curses. They've got to agree together. Well, where do we need to use this one curse we've got today? We got to buy our power, usually by sex or death or blood rituals. They buy their power from the demons in limited qualities. And so when the word of God says, resist the devil and he will flee, it is indicating to you that you resist and your power that comes from Jesus Christ himself is so much greater and unlimited that eventually the enemy must run away because he cannot match your unlimited stewarding of the blood of Christ by his limited curses. So that is the, the first thing that, I mean, it's got to own in here that concept before we, we go uh, uh, anywhere else with it. The other thing, then we'll come back to Sam and Sarah Jane, is that in scripture, witchcraft is uh, normalized. It's normal thing for the saints or the children of Israel to deal with. When did witchcraft become so abnormal for us to know what to do with? When did we become so scared of the fight? When did we back right off and go, oh, we mustn't touch or talk about that. And we put it in some kind of locked up box. You know, we'll just be superficial. We'll just, you know, pat each other on the head and say, aren't you looking lovely today? And shall we have coffee? And yes, and I'm fine and you're fine. And our interaction in church became so surface level when the word of God is very clear that witchcraft is a normal part part of of life together and let me just go through some through some things here you know god promises to punish the egyptians why because they're charmers conjurers magicians those who cast spells uh, Balaam is employed by Balak, who's a well-known soothsayer. Jezebel practices, you know, witchcraft and evil. Nineveh, the town, is judged by God as being a mistress of witchcraft. The Babylonians in Daniel's day, they're well-known astrologers, magicians, and sorcerers. Belshazzar calls on the magicians to interpret the handwriting on the wall. You know, and God says, don't be troubled by signs in the heavens as the pagans are with their astrologers. False prophets in Jeremiah and Ezekiel using divination. Now, I'm going at pace here. Why am I going at pace? I want you to see how normal it is in scripture to deal with witchcraft. And if it's normal in scripture, it's normal for you. If it's normal in scripture, it's normal for you. And we have got ourselves so scared. <gasps> we can't do that in case I'm taken out. And so when we jump to the New Testament, God is saying things like, you've got to watch Satan. He deceives the whole world. Or 1 John 1, do not believe every spirit. Matthew 24, see to it that no one misleads you. Ephesians 5, let no one deceive you. Galatians 6, do not be deceived. And this repetitive, robust focus on witchcraft is a deep concern of Jesus. And if it is a deep concern of Jesus, it should be a deep concern of ours. 
So that's me just setting the scene. Sam, Sir Jane, over to you. Yeah, so good. I think, you know, as Christians, uh, spirit-filled believers, we're super quick to talk about the usual assignments of the enemy, like fear and anxiety and pride and worry that we so often forget that actually witchcraft should be part of that normal spectrum of areas that we are continually overcoming, not just in our lives, but in the lives of others. And as Emma says there, scripture normalizes the expectation that Christians should live a life that defeats witchcraft and defeats the onslaught of witchcraft. And it doesn't normalize it in a way that says there's going to be lots of witchcraft, end of story. It normalizes it because it says there's going to be witchcraft, but remember you have the power and therefore there is an expectation that you know how to defeat the thing. I love Acts 19 as a story about what happens when a people overcome witchcraft and I really believe that God is inviting us as witchcraft starts to kind of uh, become more seen in the nations at a time like this God is inviting us to have an expectation that we are going to hit an Acts 19 moment and in Acts 19 you have there the sons of Sceva and they are going around delivering people of their demons and they get to one individual and the demon doesn't shift. It doesn't go out. In fact, it overpowers uh, the sons of Sceva and takes them out. But the question that the demonic asks of those who are delivering is who are you. And if I come in teacher mode to this particular scripture, when we talk about deliverance and we talk about top tips for defeating witchcraft, you must begin with having full confidence in who you are in Christ. I know who I am. I know I have authority. I know I am filled with the power of God. I know I am a witchcraft destroyer because that is who you've made me to be. But verse uh, 19 to 20 says this as witchcraft starts to be defeated. A number who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. Then, verse 20 says, in this way, because witchcraft was defeated, the word of the Lord spread widely and it grew in power. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and it grew in power power. Why? Because witchcraft was defeated. And the Spirit of God is saying, church, do not forget that this is one of your enemies that I have empowered you to overthrow. And as you overthrow, the Lord says, the spirit of witchcraft that is raging across the nations, expect an Acts 19 type moment where my word will spread widely and it will grow in power. And it's interesting that both those things are listed there as a result of defeating witchcraft. And if you are in an area where it's hard for the fullness of the power of God to come forth, or if you're in an environment where it's hard for truth to come forth, you've got to ask the question, is there active witchcraft? Because this verse says when witchcraft is no longer present, truth can come forth and the power of God can be made known. And so we've got to have this story written inside of us. Why? So that it creates an expectation that as we take on witchcraft, as we take on and defeat this demonic spirit that it's normal for us to defeat, it's meant to be normal for us to defeat, we see these same effects, that the word of the Lord spreads widely and that the word of God grows in power. Sarah Jane, do you want to uh, share what you're hearing and seeing about this? Sure. I love that. I love that scripture because it, it you know, it does demystify it. It's a simple thing. The power of God comes and witchcraft is defeated. The power of God is demonstrated and witchcraft is defeated. And so we see that as Emma is saying as well about Moses when he demonstrates the power of God and eats Egypt's magic for breakfast and Elijah defeats Jezebel and her witchcraft prophets with the power of God being demonstrated. And so for me, uh, God was saying even today that as witchcraft is more normalized and as darkness of witchcraft is 
is more evident in the earth. And we go to scriptures like Isaiah 61 that says, thick darkness covers the earth, but the glory of the Lord arises on us uh, to defeat the darkness. There's that sense of God saying now, actually witchcraft is and has been more normalized and now it will be weaponized. And so we need to get ahead of the curve. We need to be the power church who arises in an in, in advance of um, this arising, if you will, church of witchcraft, that are covens of witchcraft that are being weaponized as the church of God is being weaponized. Because remember, Satan does nothing other than counterfeit what God is doing. And so you see that in shops. We see it here in teenage shops like Urban Outfitters who are selling t uh, books and uh, things like tarot cards, they're selling books on, you know, easy spells, uh, learn magic, you know, easy, easy magic spells to learn. These are up there with meditation books and yoga books and help your life get better books and, you know, house plant books. These are being completely normalized to our teenagers and to our young adults. That is not just that store there's other things available there are witchcraft seminars available in the west now you know after school seminars available for the 13 year, years old plus witchcraft has been normalized now our african friends would say they've lived with witchcraft in a very uh, obvious way for many many years but the west is now having to catch up fast because it's beginning uh, to to overtake and so we have to be people people of god who understand that witchcraft is there that it's there to deceive us because we're warned in revelation 18 that actually the deception comes to nations from magic spells from witchcraft this is something we have to be really sharp on and really understood and not run away from and actually come head on to and as Emma said, we've had great experience with that over the years. I don't know, Emma, that we ever looked for that. I can remember the first time that God spoke to us prophetically in our prayer time as a team, that, that he was sending witches to us and that we would be helping them get free from covens, that we were all a little bit aghast and thinking, what? How could that possibly be? But now we, you know, we have found ourselves to be experts because we said yes to that and have had many stories, many testimonies of overcoming and helping people get out of that, but also um, releasing land and regions free from the uh, spirit of witchcraft. And so... Yeah. It is really important that we demystify it. If you're feeling right now listening to this, oh my gosh, I feel like I want to turn it off because I'm so overwhelmed with yeah. fear. You have to say, this is normal. The people of God come against witchcraft in the Bible multiple times and what? And get defeated? No, they win every time. There's yeah. victory every time. And let me tell you, it's great fun. It is, mm -hmm. it is. And actually, Karen Andrew in the comments, J.K. Rawlings has a lot to answer for. Uh, you are absolutely right. In fact, it's written in my notes here, Karen Andrew, mm. and I'd like to raise it because I do think Harry Potter has been a dangerous, soft entry into witchcraft. It has, um, uh, you know, they have deified wanting to be like that. It, it, it's, it's, it's made it something um, uh, highly desirable. And I have to say, it's, it's certainly on things like World Book Day, I don't know whether you do that uh, in other nations, but here in the yeah. UK, World Book Day has has grown and uh, and every child goes to school in the costume from their favorite book. And uh, I would say at least 80% in the primary school that my children went to turned up uh, as characters from Harry Potter's uh, trying to cast spells uh, with their, uh, so uh, an, awful, an awful lot of it, that soft entry. Okay, can we just get really practical? Um, together uh, because we know it's there, but I want to give you some very uh, entry level understanding of what you pray and what you say and what you do. Now, if at any point we are not clear, please type in the comments. This is something we, we, we need to be have a robust clarity over, all right? And I noticed there's um, some uh, questions. What I think I'm going to do, because there's so many, and I don't want to leave the questions over this, is I'm going to get one of my 
my team to just scroll through them all and uh, write them out uh, so that uh, we, we don't miss them probably tomorrow and the next day because they're going so fast with so many of you on. There's about a thousand of you on live at the moment with us. So th there's two military strategies. The first military strategy is that I have to learn what it is to protect what is mine, okay? I have to have a defensive strategy first, all right? My defensive strategy needs to put a firewall up between my family and what the witchcraft community is doing. Now, if I stay in defense all the time, I'm likely to become scared. And so we deal with defense, but we also then have an offensive strategy that takes witchcraft out of nations, out of regions, and out of territories. So you're going to be defensive, but you're also going to learn to be offensive. It is vitally important that you have both aspects to be a really good military strategist, all right? And so we'll start with the defensive stuff, but I don't want any of you going, ah, you know, or they can get, me. no, they, they really, they really can't get you. This is this good military battle strategy, okay? So mm -hmm. and maybe we will come on to the offensive stuff, but let's start defensive, defensive, and then attack, right? Okay. So, you will know, or if you don't know, this may be news to you, that clearly the, the people of God have prayer calendars. You and I are used to repetitive prayers. We have our festivals, our Easter's, our Christmases. We have things that we pray at different times of the year. Uh, we're very grateful at Christmas for the incarnation of Christ. We have prayer lists. Well, I hope you do, that you maybe ring a friend on a prayer chain and you say, you know, we've been asked to pray for so-and-so who's just got a bad diagnosis. And we are used to having cycles of prayer and cycles of covering one each, each other when we stumble. It is the same in the witchcraft community. They have cursing calendars and cursing cycles, all right? And so sometimes you'll come to a place where you think, I've just had this victory, I've just had this breakthrough, but I see to then smack and I hit cycles where I feel overwhelmed, particularly I want to say in areas of health, that would be very normal, all right? And so cycles are, are in the Christian calendar, but they are also in the witchcraft calendar. And so one of the first things that we start to pray in our initial defensive strategy is I take myself off the cursing calendars. In the name of Jesus, these are simple prayers, simple prayers. In the name of Jesus, I put a hiddenness over my family. I say that I am not fair game for the cursing cycle of the enemy. I say that I am not hidden from where I'm on a repetitive loop where witchcraft seems to come back and get me when I seem to break through. Now, if you have any degree of um, uh, proactive life about you, if your church is going for it, if you are going for it, you are likely to find yourself on a witchcraft cursing calendar. Do not be scared. You just take yourself off it in the name of Jesus. It is that simple. What? You resist the devil. That is a prayer of resistance. What does he do? He must flee. We don't get, I was going to say, we don't get our knickers in a twist. Genuinely, I just want us to go, oh, this is my bread and butter, okay? Okay. So you take yourself off a cursing calendar. Number one of a defensive strategy. Sam, Sarah Jane, do you want to comment on that? Did I miss anything out about cursing calendars? Oh, you're... No, I don't think there's anything you've missed out about, about cursing calendars. No, I think that's that's good. Sometimes I think when we've prayed about this, if it's somebody who's, as you say, really pioneering or championing a cause in yeah. in Christian world and they're very well known, sometimes it's good to almost like prophetically tear up the cursing calendar and and have agreement. Again, sometimes yeah. you just need agreement because remember, coven is agreement and all these curses come by agreement, in agreement with two or more. 
just as we say where two or more are gathered, there is Jesus. Two or more are gathered in the coven, there's agreement for cursing. And so you want to sometimes get yeah. someone to agree with you um, uh, if it's more uh, sticky to move. Okay, yeah. so cursing calendar is number one of your defensive strategy. Number two of your defensive strategy um, is that you want to make sure that any curse raised against you is dealt with. So I would be praying something like this. Any hex, any spell, any incantation, any um, act or ceremony that was done that pertains to me and my family, I break its effect. It is that simple. I break its effect. Now, it depends which part of the world you're in, whether it's a voodoo uh, sect or whether it's, uh, you know, a white witchcraft, a shamanism or, you know, so we're not going to list all of the sorts of witchcraft, but you may want to get specific because, you know, in your nation, uh, there's a very specific name given to the witchcraft community. So in the name of Jesus, I break, you can repeat this after me, you know, uh, uh, as you listen back, I break every incantation, hex, spell, curse, potion, whatever has been done against me, I now render it null and void in the name of Jesus. What has been raised up as a standard against me is now undermined by the blood of Jesus. And I go into defensive warfare against the, the land and the territory that they have already taken from me. Where there has been a curse of depression, where there's been a curse of cancer or sickness, where there's been a curse of homelessness or joblessness, where there's been a curse of unemployment, where there's been a curse of the, the, the breaking up of the family unit. I go in the spirit realm defensively and I say that may not hold any power. So you'll understand where you see the curse outworked because you'll understand where the problems are in your family and you pray those kind of setting the boundary type prayers. Any more on that you guys? Um, just thinking about uh, the defense and how sometimes inadvertently we may have open doors to that. And so, you know, if you have a robber in your house, um, did you leave the door open and he just wandered in? And so, you know, if there's witchcraft curses affecting you and your family, might there be an open door either from something that you've done or someone in the family's done who's alive or somebody in the family who is dead? And we would call that generational curses where the doors, if you will, spiritually have been potentially left open. And so you may have uh, aunts or uncles or grandparents who've been involved um, in mediumship or clairvoyancy or uh, tarot card reading, or they may have have dabbled with a Ouija board or you may have or uh, even as Emma said you may have watched um, witchcraft films knowingly or unknowingly like something like as as if you will palatable to the culture now as as Harry Potter or something more dark uh, like a poltergeist or uh, I can't even think of any of the names all these horrible horror films that are out there right now that may have opened the door to witchcraft and so the first thing you need to do in that case is repent you need to repent and break agreement with the spirit of witchcraft that has come in either by your own actions, by a family member's actions, alive or dead. And then you simply pray. And then after repentance and renouncing the spirit of witchcraft, you simply pray a closing of that door and a rejecting of the spirit of witchcraft, both from your life and from your family and from your home. As Emma said, that which is yours, you have complete authority over, complete designation over. And within that context, there is never, ever any backlash as you're, you're asking. There is never, ever any counter attack because what is given to you and yours is your right and to defend and has been given to you anything that might be business that might be resources money health uh, property um children etc etc and so what is yours is given to you to oversee spiritually and to steward so you have the ability to pray and defeat witchcraft very simply in that context <clears throat> sam 
Yeah, uh, and just on that as well, as we're building this wall uh, of defense uh, through all these different things, you know, what does the Bible say combats curses? Luke 6, 28 is super plain and simple. You bless those who curse you. You bless those who curse you. And it's important to build a, a robust blessing and decree habit in your life that repels curses that actually when you are decreeing and you're blessing and you're releasing the good things of the kingdom of God, you start to build a wall around you that repels curses because blessings trump curses all of the time. And so when you build that, and I'm not just talking about when witchcraft starts to knock at your door, but when you build that rhythm in your life of you're decreeing over yourself daily, you're blessing yourself daily, you're cultivating uh, those two elements as a as a good discipline that you are daily engaging in, you start to really build a strong wall that repels these witchcraft curses that come to try and to, to get to you. And simple curse, simple uh, decrees, even just decreeing, I am blessed in the name of Jesus. I am blessed because I'm blessed because I'm blessed. I am covered by your blood. I'm protected, God. I'm in your arms, your goodness and your mercy are following me. These simple scriptural truths, as you start to decree them, build that wall that repel curses and stop them coming near you. Okay, so let me put those into an order because they're covering some rich stuff. So one, take your name off cursing calendars. Two, break any spells, incantation, hexes, whatever potions they've done. Okay, number three, which was what Sarah Jane was, was talking about, break the generational curses. In other words, deal with your family line sins and iniquities. I and, and these prayers are simple. Father, in the name of Jesus, I am sorry for where my family line both going before me have opened doors. I am sorry where they partnered with witchcraft. I'm sorry where they offended you. You come in repentance and then you say, in the name of Jesus, I cut off that ability for that generational sin to visit me. So cursing calendars, break the hexes and spells, deal with the generational curses. Again, what am I talking to you about? I'm talking to you about how you start defensively getting your world and your zone free from this slime of the enemy before we become uh, offensive, all right? Number four, Four of your defensive strategy, Sam and Sarah Jane, both alluding to it there, was look at yourself and close your own doors, all right? Number three is generational curses. Number four is your own doors. Now, David, can you put up a um, that verse uh, from Proverbs, uh, let's go, 26, there we go. Now, this is really important when we're dealing with number four of self-curses. You are not fair game for the enemy. Somebody needs to type that in the comments. I am not an easy target for the enemy. I am not an easy target for the enemy. We've got to know that. Why? Like a fluttering sparrow. You can read this out word out loud with me. It's on the screen. Proverbs 26, 2. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. I am not deserving of curses. It cannot land on me. Got to memorize. You got to memorize that verse like a fluttering sparrow. I think all of my my staff group up here know that verse off by heart, don't you? <laughs> uh, it's it's so much a key verse for our culture, yeah. like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow. An undeserved curse does not rest. So therefore, if you are somebody in the comments saying I'm being oppressed by a demon, 
And a number of you are kind of saying that because, of course, we've got you on YouTube, we've got you on Facebook, and all the comments are coming through here. If you are being oppressed, you got to ask, where is the door open? Where is there a sin in my life? Where is there a sin in my family that allowed this to become deserved? You will not be going uh, through the mill unless there is an open door, all right? And it just can't land. It cannot land, all right? And so, yes, there may be some oppression, but if you are really being mauled by the enemy, you've got to ask some deep and personal questions. So cursing calendars, breaking the hexes, dealing with the generational curses and dealing with your open doors. Uh, uh, you know, whether that's I need to repent, I've done yoga, you know, I've watched too many horror films and, uh, you know, I've, I've let my guard down. I've listened to kind of music that's really polluted my brain. You know, whatever it is for you that has opened a door so that the enemy can come in and piggyback on the back of that. That That's really important that that's, uh, that, that is understood. It's on the screen there. It's Proverbs 26, verse 2. It cannot land. Now, can we just talk before I go on to point number five about backlash? It doesn't exist. Oh, I just shot a holy cow. It does not exist. Come on. If you have all power and you have all authority, the only place Satan can go to get power and authority, I think I wrote this in my book, is you. And so if you believe in the backlash, you give away part of your authority for Satan to give you backlash. If you don't believe it, it doesn't happen. Ah, oh, that's a sila right now. <laughs> <laughs> so see right now. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, which one of you gorgeous people want to talk about point five, which is anointing houses with oil? And how do you do that? That's number five in your defensive strategy. Yeah, yeah, sure. So important. Uh, and as Emma was saying, we've got to be super practical about this. Uh, and sometimes we can make things uh, and make prayers and make breaking agreement and overcoming witchcraft really complicated. Um, but let's simplify it. It's important that we learn to to anoint our houses and that to be something that we do regularly. And anointing your house is primarily about taking ownership of what God has put into your hands and making it a kingdom of God, pure place. And so very simply, you're going to want some anointing oil. That can just be some normal oil that you pray over and bless. It does not need to be super expensive, fancy anointing oil. It's oil that you own that's in your hands. I bless this oil for the purposes of the kingdom of God. And you want to go around the parameters of your house, both inside and outside, particularly focusing on the physical entry points of your home. But remember, we do this by the spirit. We don't want to uh, come up with formulas that, that are unhelpful. So a helpful prayer is, God, shine your light on the particular areas that you want me to focus on. So for me in particular, I remember I moved into a flat you know, a couple of years ago uh, and stayed there before I moved back home for a short while. Uh, and I was anointing my house with oil uh, one day, just um, after living in it for a few days. And there was just this one corner that God just called me to focus my attention on. It wasn't a window, it wasn't a door, it was this tiny little corner in the side of my room that he said, I want you to anoint with oil. And as I did, the atmosphere in the house completely shifted and it was almost an atmosphere that I hadn't felt before. So you go around your house, you anoint with oil and you pray simple prayers with, I declare that this is a kingdom of God atmosphere and only the things of the kingdom of God may remain here. And you can pray if you feel like there's a darkness or there is uh, a heaviness. I just speak to anything of the enemy and say, leave now. And you declare this is a kingdom of God 
atmosphere. This is a kingdom of God home. And someone's saying, how often is frequent for anointing your homes? At, by the Spirit. When do you feel you need to? One time is, is often enough. But actually, if you feel like there have been people in my home or there has been something going on around my house, that I feel like actually I would like to anoint my house again. Do it then. Just go and anoint and you pray those simple prayers. Let me give you that prayer again. Only things of the kingdom of God may remain here. And I banish in the name of Jesus anything of darkness. Yeah, and actually Kerry Iyer McGoldrick, she's saying, I do hotel rooms and beds too. So do what? I. High five to you across the airways. Yeah. Uh, this is a standard practice. I don't think, I don't know, you don't have a handbag, Sam, but Sarah no. Jane and I always have a few bottles of anointing oil. Around, a million, that's it, in the no, bottom I don't of have one. Uh, you know, we, we usually do, and yeah. uh, and yeah. and and all good intercessors salt, salt. a bag of yeah. salt. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah, because uh, actually, could I just talk about that? Because I think adding on to what Sam was saying, uh, the the anointing oil, but also then the covenanting your property with mm. salt is really powerful. So if you, this is really only work works particularly well I think if you own a property or if you have ownership versus rental rental it doesn't always work the same outside you can't always do your garden in a rental property because it's it's co-owned or it's owned by the landlord but anything you own or you're paying for your building your room whatever you can do this salt is a sign of covenant and it covenants the land the promise to God as you pray so we've done this before in a number of places on assignment prayer assignments but also in our own properties to put salt in the corners of the property to covenant that land to to God and that is something that isn't needed to be done as often as anointing I think like Sam says uh, sometimes if we've been away on holiday or been away for a while or something's gone on then you might want to re-anoint your your garden or your household or your doors and your windows only um and that will shift it. The other thing I would say is sometimes there's objects on land and sometimes there's objects in your house. And so God may by the spirit just alert you to that. It may be a rental property and there's something in there that you think, I don't like the feel of that. Or you've bought something before you were Christian or someone's given you something and there may be witchcraft kind of curses attached to that. Uh, look for those things and be aware of them by the spirit of God and do what Holy Spirit tells you to do with them. Yes, and somebody's saying, what about Elise? Yeah, David and I lease our house. And of course, we pay for it. So therefore, we, we have authority for the time that we're here. So we anoint it uh, with oil. And uh, in terms of the how frequent, I find that when we're in particularly battle type days and there are there are seasons in life that are more battling you know maybe you're dealing with a sickness or you're 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 taking new grind and um, uh, then sometimes you just anoint your house more frequently because you are aware of the battle um, and you just want to uh, do the, make sure that your defensive strategy is you know you've covered all bases now the other thing I actually just reached forward into my um, my pen holder my pen and pencil holder and reached out um, these, which uh, we buy in mass quantities, 10 pegs, 10 pegs. We always have a few 10 pegs lying around. I'm sure the Amazon delivery man must go, this family have ordered 200 tent pegs. What on earth are they doing? In fact, I've ordered more than that on one count. Anyway, and it's nothing, there's nothing that's particularly, you know, special about the temp peg. You know, let's not go all mystic or weird, you know. But actually, I've uh, given temp pegs to my children. You know, we've marched out just because I think it's good to have a prophetic act. And we have staked the grind. You know, I, Isaiah 54 says, Let, you know, lengthen your cords, secure the stakes. And my children have all got hammer and they've staked temp pegs in, uh, you know. Know, and they have said, you know, this is our land and we bless it, you know, and we're going to sleep well here and there's going to be unity and peace here and there's going to be God dreams. And, you know, so uh, I, 
order yourself it is it's actually really quite fun and um, i know especially since i don't like camping that is very true joyce i hate camping uh, and here i own i don't own a tent i'm very pleased to say i don't own a tent but um anyway i own 10 things um, and whoever lives in this house after us will probably go with their who they're who hoovering the lawn who hoovers the lawn um mowing the lawn couldn't think of the word they'll probably think what a weird family there's 10 pegs all around the perimeter of this property so um enjoy enjoy the journey of def of setting up your boundaries defensively now tomorrow we're going to come back to this because our time is nearly gone and uh, we'll answer some of the questions uh, and we're going to move on to witchcraft two and three because we were just dealing with uh witchcraft out there uh, 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 that is black and dark, how to defend yourself. We'll start to talk about uh, 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 attacking rather than defending tomorrow. I know 10 pegs, somebody's going, 10 pegs, really? I know, I know. Uh, but I have to say, enjoy the fight. Oh, enjoy that you win. Enjoy that cleansing moment where you defend your own. Enjoy the power in the name of Jesus that says, I break that which stands against me. Get that little glint in your eye. Get them your mouth turned up into that kind of wry smile and enjoy the power of God gifted to you to defend and then attack. Sam, do you want to finish us off? Yeah, I think so good. Be enthused as you go away that you have been given all power and all authority. And if you go today and as you go, you want it give yourself homework and this is really what i would like to give you homework to decree before tomorrow god you have given me authority and you have given me power god you have said that i am meant to trample witchcraft under my feet god you have said that when i fight in your name i win and there are no bad repercussions there is no backlash and start to decree some of the truths that we have been sharing with you today why you want to shift your mindset with us as we go on this journey this week into the reality that you are a victorious war warrior that that is who you are by default it is who you are it is intrinsic to your dna i am a victorious warrior so we just bless you right now in the name of jesus right now to have a shift in your mindset to come on this journey with us that you are one called by god to defeat witchcraft as a normal part of your life have an amazing day and we shall see you tomorrow for part two of defeating witchcraft see you then bye